Uh, Matthew 26 and verse 31 is where we are this morning, amen. Uh, We are going to be teaching you on the passion of the Christ, amen. The passion of the Christ is his torture before he went to Calvary. Uh, The arrest of Jesus, the arrest of Jesus, amen, is what we'll be looking at today. So verse 31 If you have it, say, praise the Lord. Amen. Then saith Jesus unto them, all ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night, before the cock crows, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now. We ask your blessing to be upon the reading of your holy word. Give you all glory and honor and praise for it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Praise him one more time before you sit down. Amen, amen. All right, Lord bless you. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus prophesies the denial of all of his disciples, not just Judas Iscariot, but all of his disciples would uh, turn away from him, amen, in that night season. The denial of Peter is foretold, et cetera, et cetera, and we're going to look at the events surrounding that. Zechariah 13 and verse 7, if you'd like to turn there, this is the prophecy uh, that Jesus is speaking about, amen. He says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn my hand upon the little ones. So the the scripture is very clear. Zechariah tells us that his disciples would forsake him. Amen. Praise the Lord. Of course, Peter is going to deny what the Bible says. How many people are like that, right? The Word of God says, says something. They say, no. Amen. Holy Ghost. The Bible says you need the Holy Ghost. Some people say, no. Don't need the Holy Ghost. But the Bible said it. It prophesied it. Zechariah 13, 7. That this would happen. That all of his disciples would be scattered. They would forsake him. They would deny him. At the moment that he needed them the most, they would abandon him. Isn't that sad? Amen. But that's the Bible. The scripture said that it would happen that way. And it was the night night time of his betrayal. And so he is telling them what is going to happen. In verse 33, again, Peter says unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, This night before the cock crows, Thou shalt deny me three times. So once again, Jesus tells even Peter that he would deny him that night. He says, Before the cock crows, Thou shalt deny me three times. What is the cock crow? Well, it is not a rooster. It's not the fowl, the poultry fowl uh, that you're thinking about when it talks about the cock here. In that culture, in that area, in that part of geographical location, there is what is called peacocks. This isn't the poultry cock, okay? And what is interesting about the peacock is that the peacock can be trained to sound every two hours. As the sun goes down, two hours later, the peacock will sound. And then two hours after that, Throughout the night, the peacock will sound throughout the night. Now, obviously, this could be the trumpet that sounded on the third watch as well, because that was called the cock crowing. Amen. 
But I think it's interesting in that culture that you do have the peacock. And that the peacock, throughout the night, you'd hear the peacock. I don't know if you've ever heard of the peacock before. Amen. Have anybody ever heard of the peacock before? Go off, man. We were out of town one time, and, and uh, we were camping out. And I heard this screech. I mean, you could hear it through the mountains, the Gila wilderness, you know. And you could hear that thing. I guess there was a farm somewhere, a farmhouse or whatever around there close by. But I'm going to tell you something. That thing let out a wail. I mean, you could hear it for miles and miles and miles. And so this is very well possible, a peacock here that he's talking about here. Before the cock crows twice, you'll deny me three times. It's also interesting that the peacock was a burglar, burglar alarm. <laughs> They're pretty smart birds. Amen. And the reason, uh, this is why it's called the fowl of conscience. It was known as the fowl of conscience. Because if somebody walked up in the yard and it wasn't a part of the family, the peacock would start sounding an alarm. It was a burglar alarm. Amen? <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And what's interesting also is called, again, the foul of conscience is if that person, if it came, if that person with the burglar came, if it ever showed up again around that peacock, the peacock would remember. Even if that person was never caught. The peacock would remember that person and start sounding the alarm. So whether it's the third watch of the day, uh, of the night, which is, you know, watch, you got, uh, what, six to nine, nine to 12, 12 to three, third watch of the night, three to six. Amen. Whether it's that or if it is the peacock, it's just interesting because the Lord prophesied that this would happen. Amen. And what is Peter's response? He said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. Amen? Amen. You know, this teaches us that everybody at some point in their life comes short of God. That's why we need the Lord. Because we all come short of God. Amen? And he's the, he, what he does is he takes us. In our failures and in our shortcomings, if we allow him to, that's key. You have to allow him to do it. In all our shortcomings and all our failures, if we allow him to, he can take us and make us what we should be. That's what he did for his disciples. Amen? So the Bible tells us in verse 36, after he prophesies of this event, they make their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, the whole time that he, after he left the upper room and he's making his way to the Garden of Gethsemane, the whole time he's teaching his disciples. And you can study that in John chapter 13 through 17, okay? He's in the upper room teaching them. As he's walking to the Garden of Gethsemane, he's teaching them as well. And then verse 36, he comes to the Garden of Gethsemane, which means the olive press. So it would have been a garden of olives and their olive trees, and then there would have been a press in that place to press out the oil of the olives. And that's what Gethsemane means. It means the olive press. As he comes to that place called Gethsemane, he saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then said he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep. And saith unto Peter, What could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed and said, Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. He came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. He left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now, take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed in the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, 
he is at hand that doth betray me. The Gospel of Luke brings us something very interesting about this event. The Bible says that Jesus was in such agony, emotional and spiritual agony at this time, that the sweat began to be mingled with the blood. And that blood mingled with sweat began to drop upon the ground. And that's called a hematidrosis. The Greeks call it a hematidrosis. That means the mingling of the sweat with the blood. And it is caused when somebody is extremely emotionally stressed. The Romans experienced, the Greeks experienced it at times throughout history, so it wasn't a new event. But what we see Jesus in the olive press here, he is under such emotional stress. He is in such agony. He's agonizing. Literally, he is moving into traumatic shock. Amen? Because he's fixing to die for the sins of the world. What he went through that night is beyond comprehension. I don't necessarily agree with this, but there are some scholars that believe that what Jesus went through before he went to Calvary was worse than Calvary itself. Just the mental anguish that he was in, the spiritual agony, the stress that he was going through to the point that blood was mingled with his sweat falling to the ground. Amen. Traumatic shock. He went to his disciples and he told them, he says, I'm about to die. The stress and the agony that he was going through was so severe that he was about to die. See, if the devil could have killed him before he got to Calvary, the devil knew that Jesus could not redeem us from our sins. So he launched an all-out attack against Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane there. And the stress again and the agony and the pressure was beyond comprehension. He asked his disciples to watch and pray with him. Amen. To be there for him. To help him through this time. But the Bible says that they all went to sleep. Jesus went to them on a couple occasions. And and admonished them again to pray. He said the spirit indeed is willing. But the flesh is weak. He said pray that you enter not into temptation. He had already prophesied that they would betray him. He had already prophesied that they would deny him. And now we find out one of the reasons why they did. Because when the pressure came, when the time came for them to take a stand for him, they were not prayed up. It shows us how important prayer is. Amen. Because the spirit that we have inside of us is willing, but the flesh is weak. So we need to pray that we'd have the strength to make it through those times. Amen. Have you ever been stressed out before? Have you ever gone through any kind of agony in your life over some situation or somebody? Amen. Have you ever been in a place in your life where you're just about that close of denying the Lord? The Lord is showing you the answer here is prayer. And because they did not pray, the Bible lets us know when they did not pray, they fell apart. If we don't pray, we're going to fall apart in the time of stress and pressure and agony. In the time of temptation, we're going to fall apart if we're not praying. We need a prayer life. Amen. Praise God. It's not just some religious activity that we go through, but it does something in us. It fortifies us. It gives us the strength to go through difficult times in our life. And what the Lord is showing you here is this. If he would go through something like that, it's an encouragement for you and I that when you go through things in your life, to not depart from God. Amen. Not depart from the Lord. In fact, throughout church history, when men preached this very text right here, they said it was to encourage the believers not to give up in the time of trouble. It is to encourage you and I when you're going through difficult times and you feel like quitting. Jesus told them, you're going to quit on me. Peter said, I'm not going to quit on you. Though every man quits on you, I won't quit on you. But the Lord said, you will quit on me. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, there's nobody in this church that's strong without God. Nobody is strong without without prayer. Nobody is strong without walking close to the Lord. There is nobody. I don't care. Amen. You might in your mind think that you're really strong. You might in your mind say, I got it all together, Pastor. I'm good. There's nothing wrong with me. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, today, 
If that's the case, I rejoice with you, but you need to continue to pray. Because if you don't, when the time comes, and there's going to be a time of testing that's going to come in your life, and you will quit him, you will give up on him because of the stress maybe you're going through or whatever you're facing, but prayer will fortify you. Prayer will get you through, hallelujah. Praise will bring you through your trial and your test. Amen. Give God praise in the house today. So when I see Jesus going through such agony and torment, literally, it's a pre-crucifixion torture that he's going through, you know. And I don't want to just read the text and I don't want to just preach it to you. I want to enter into it. I want to really feel emotionally what Jesus did to a certain extent so that whenever I go through things in my life, I keep pressing on and I keep praying and I keep trusting the Lord. Amen. He tells us in verse 39, he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed saying, oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but thou will be done. Amen. Amen. Not my will, but your will be done. Amen. If it's possible that this cup would pass from me. And what, there's so many different explanations for the cup, right? Is he pulling back because he's fixing to die? Is he asking not to die? He knew he came to die. Is he pulling back because he's afraid of going to the cross? Is he pulling back because he doesn't want to go through the pain? No. Mm -mm. There are people that have died and they weren't even martyrs for the faith. They died, but they were courageous. This isn't about Jesus pulling back from going through that event that, the next na that night and the next day. It wasn't about him because he was trying to escape pain in his life or suffering in his life. That wasn't what this was about. What he's saying is, I'm drinking a cup that belongs to somebody else. I'm going to share, if you will, and I don't like the word fate, but so you'll understand. When you take that cup, you're saying, I'm willing to take, I'm willing to share the fate of somebody else. So when he took that cup, he said, I'm willing to take somebody else's sin. I'm willing to take it upon my body, upon that cross, and I'm willing to die. I'm willing to take the fate of somebody else. I'm willing to enter into the guilt of somebody else. He wasn't shrinking, shrinking back from thinking about dying. He wasn't shrinking back from the pain that he might go through. He wasn't shrinking back from that. He's, he's agonizing because he knows that when the sin comes upon him, he becomes the sin bearer. He'll be separated from the Father. Amen. The devil is trying to kill him right now. Amen. He's, not, he's a man of mans. Jesus was a man of mans. A lot of times you see movies or you hear stories about Jesus. They, they sort of paint him effeminate. No, Jesus was strong. He was a man of men, brothers and sisters. He was courageous. He wasn't backing down from what he was about to go through. He just did not want to be separated from the Father. And I'm talking about the man Christ Jesus. He was God, but he didn't want to be separated from the Father. And he knew that that was going to happen. Amen. So he prayed, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, I will not settle for less. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. I won't settle for less, Jesus said, than your will. Amen. Whatever your will is, if your will is for me to go to that cross and die and be separated from you so that people can be saved, he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And sweat rolling down his face with blood, the passion of the Christ. Nobody there to help him. Nobody there to support him. He's got to go through it alone. I mean, you look at it, you can say, how could it be that the disciples would abandon him in the time of his need? How is it possible? It must be that way. Because Jesus, what he's going to go through, he must go through alone. Nobody can go through it with him. He's got to go through it alone. Amen. And so it was prophesied that it would happen just this way. And so in agony, he prays. 
He goes to the disciples, verse 41, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Amen? Amen. He doesn't have his support, doesn't have his friends to support him, but he's got prayer. And sometimes when you get in a lonely place and you don't look around and there's nobody there to help you, nobody there supporting you, your friends have abandoned you. Those that you, you thought you could depend upon, they're gone. You got prayer. You have prayer. Praise the Lord. I told my wife the other day about a situation that we're personally uh, watching very carefully. And uh, I said, I don't know where things are right now. And I'm not talking about anybody in the church. I said, I don't know where things are right now in this situation. Praise the Lord. And I said, but I'm not going to dig. I'm not going to ask questions. Because there's nothing I can do about it anyway. Amen. I'm just going to pray and I'm just going to trust God. And sometimes that's all you got, brothers and sisters, you know. You'd like to know how this person is and, and where they are and what's going on with them, you know. And you'd like to, you know, question them and find out what things are all about. But sometimes you just got to lift your hands off of it and just say, Lord God, I can't do anything about it anyway. So I'm just going to go to God in prayer. And I'm going to seek the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Because there's just some things I can't change. There's some things that might even be appointed for me. And so, but we have prayer, brothers and sisters. And prayer will strengthen you. Prayer will, will fortify you. will undergird you. It'll get you through difficult times in your life. It'll make you strong where you were weak. Hallelujah. It'll give you faith when you had doubt. It'll bring a daylight to your life instead of a nighttime season that you're going through. God tells us the answer to our strength is prayer. Say praise the Lord, church. So this encourages me when I read what the Lord went through in his passion. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Isn't it a mystery? Prayer is a mystery, isn't it? How it works. You go in a prayer room and you feel all down and dark and gloomy and without hope, helpless and discouraged and you know how it goes. And then you come out of that room and something's changed. It's a mystery. All I can tell you is that God is in it. And when I seek God, because He's the living God, when I seek Him, God meets with me and, and He's inside of me and He does something on the inside of me and I, and I have something I didn't have before that prayer time. I have something inside of me I didn't have before that worship time. Amen. With the Lord. Praise God, brothers and sisters. So we thank God for it. And He went away again the second time praying, Oh, oh Father, Abba, say Abba. I love this. See, when we read it, it's Father. But the Greek is Abba. Abba. He called on the Father here. He said, Abba. Verse 39, oh my Abba. And then we see it again in verse 42. Oh my Abba. This teaches you how to pray when you're in sorrow. I don't want you to miss that. I want you to hear what I'm saying. This teaches you how to pray when there's sorrow in your life. You call him Abba. Daddy. He's your daddy. Very intimate. Jesus here in the Garden of Gethsemane calls him Abba. Daddy. Something very intimate. So when you're going through something and you're suffering and you're in sorrow in your life, that's how you pray. You go to him as your daddy. Abba, very intimate, brothers and sisters. It's, it's almost too intimate. But that's who he is for us. I need him this morning. He's my Abba. He's my daddy. He's my father. Hallelujah. Life brings a lot of challenges to it. A lot of sorrow, a lot of pain, a lot of tears. But he's my Abba. He remains my Abba today. Oh, my Abba. If this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. He's a mighty God. Amen. If you look at Hebrews chapter 5, the Bible tells us something very interesting about Jesus' prayer. Hebrews 5. 
Amen. Amen. In verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears. When Jesus was in the garden that night and he was praying, brothers and sisters, you could hear his wail, his cry, his tears miles away. It's no understatement. He lifted up his voice. It wasn't some little quiet prayer. He lifted up his prayer in strong cryings and tears. You could hear him a mile away, brothers and sisters, as he lifted up his voice to Abba in the garden. Sometimes when you pray, you pray quiet prayers, simple prayers. But sometimes the prayer of supplication. Supplication is stronger than a simple prayer. Sometimes you don't have t- time to pray supplication, do you? Or you're about to have a car wreck. All you can say is, Jesus. Don't you never say, Jesus. I mean, you don't have time to do strong crying for Jesus. Just some simple little prayer, just whispering of his name, Jesus. And he intervenes. But sometimes you have to enter into supplication. And supplication is a strong prayer. It's a prayer where you're asking God to supply something in your life. Supplication, it's a strong prayer. Intercession is also a very strong prayer. So the Bible says about Jesus. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications. See, there's a simple prayer. Prayers and and supplications. With strong crying and tears. Sometimes you got to give it all you got. You got to put your emotion in it, your heart in it, your physical strength in it. Everything you've got, brothers and sisters. And, and I, you know, the fervent, the Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah prayed, it didn't rain. He prayed again, then it rained. That's the power of prayer. So sometimes you have to move beyond the simple prayer, Jesus. And you got to cry like, <laughs> Sister Jackie texted me the other day and asked me, said, Pastor, uh, Sister Veronica and I would like to go into the prayer room. It was an off day. And uh, is it okay? I said, of course it's okay. That's your house. You want to pray? You want to seek God? That church is your house. You go in that prayer room and you pray. Sometimes, brothers, I'm telling you, you got to get really, really strong in your prayer. A strong supplication. You hear people in the prayer room, they're screaming at the top of their lungs. Why is that? Well, they may be feeling good, but they also might be going through some things. Sister Jackie, how would you feel after you got out of that prayer room? Yeah, see, it makes a difference, right? It makes a difference. God will be there to help you when you need him. Praise the Lord. And Jesus, the Bible said he offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears. Unto him that was able to save him, look at this, from death. Amen? Amen. And was heard in that he feared. Did you hear that? The Bible says that God heard his prayer when he prayed for God to save him from death. He still went to the cross. Then how is that possible? If the Bible says he lifted up his voice in strong cries and tears and God heard him, he was praying about salvation from death. I want you to understand what I'm saying, what the Bible is saying. Jesus did not pray he would be safe from dying. He prayed that he'd be safe from death. Did y'all hear that? He did not pray he would be safe from dying. He prayed that he'd be safe from death. So he went to the cross and he died, but God didn't leave him in the grave. God raised him from the dead on the third day. He didn't save him from dying. He saved him from death. And through his death on the cross, listen to me. He provided eternal life for you. He saved us from eternal damnation or eternal death. So God heard his prayer and saved him, listen, from eternal damnation. 
He saved him from eternal death. He brought him through death. Hallelujah. Brought him through death on the other side. Raised him from the dead. How is that possible then? That God could offer you eternal life. But God saved him from eternal death. Right? Because the wage of sin is death. Eternal damnation is the wages of sin. Then how is it that Jesus didn't have to perish in hell forever in order to save you? Because when he died, he, his, the kind of life that he offered when he died was eternal life. The life that he offered was different than your life. The life that he offered was eternal life. And so because he offered his own life, which is eternal life, God raised him from the dead. And now because of the kind of life he offered, he's able to give you eternal life, even though he didn't perish forever and ever and ever. God heard his prayer and raised him out of death, not from dying. Some of y'all, God has spoken to you in the times of prayer. Amen. And you know God heard you, but you misinterpreted what you thought he said. You thought he said you weren't going to die. He said he was going to save you from death. Big difference. Are y'all understand what I'm saying? Well, God let me down because he told me, you know, I was in prayer and he told me this and that and it didn't happen. You didn't listen well. God did not save Jesus from dying. He saved him from death. And because of that, you and I have eternal life today. Praise the Lord. So he said, Abba, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again for their eyes were heavy. You know, I'm sure their spirit, the Bible said their spirit wanted to do it. But they got tired. Maybe it's because they ate that, that big meal, big old amen Passover meal before they went out to the prayer room, you know. Hallelujah. It's probably not a good idea to eat a big meal and then go pray. Hallelujah. You might find yourself going to sleep from a full tummy. They just finished the Passover meal and there they are and you know, they just, man, they're probably fighting sleep and they're wanting to pray. They got their heart in it right and sh their bodies won't cooperate. Right. How many of y'all ever been there where you want to do something in your spirit, but your body just wouldn't cooperate? Yeah. Sister Brittany, you found your keys. God bless you. Hallelujah. I told you you would. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. God heard your prayer, right? Amen. But I've been there at times when, man, I'm so tired. You know, my spirit says, yeah, you need to do this. You need. God talks to you. You know, it's amazing. God has me up at times, and it's almost the same time. It's 3.33 3, 3 in the morning. 3.33. And I can't tell you how many times I'll get up in the, in the morning. 3.33, look over the clock. It's 3.33. 3, 3. Well, when it's like that over and over and over, God's probably waking you up on that moment. And say, go get some prayer. Hallelujah to the Lord. Because you're going to need it the next day. God knows what we need, doesn't he? He's our Abba. Sometimes we just have to go to God, say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. I'm not going to tell you how to fix it. I'm not going to tell you what to do. God, I'm just going to say, whatever your will is. If I've got to go through this test, if I've got to go through this trial, if I've got to go through this pain, Lord God, you're going to get me through it. That's what's important. Amen. But they're asleep, no support. From the ones that were the closest to him. And he just looks at him and he says, okay, sleep on now. For the hour is at hand that the Son of Man is betrayed in the hands of sinner. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Amen. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came with him a great multitude. John says it was a band. That means 600 to 1,000 temple guards that night went to get Jesus. 600 to 1,000 guards to get one man. Here they come. Jesus is our, he knows what's going to happen. And Judas has already entered into an agreement with him. Says, I'm going to kiss him. That's the sign. 
You know, because obviously they don't know who, which one it is. It's dark. And all the disciples look alike. Jesus Christ could blend in and look like the rest of the disciples. Because they all look alike. Amen. If they all had, listen, if Jesus had short hair, they all had short hair. Are you understanding? Say, no, I believe Jesus had long hair. Well, in that culture, men didn't have long hair. But I'll just say it this way. If Jesus had short hair, they all had short hair. If Jesus had long hair, which I don't believe he did, they all had long hair. So how are you going to know which one's Jesus? So Judas says, I'll tell you what, I will give you a sign. I'll kiss him. I'll greet him. Amen. It wasn't a passionate kiss. In that culture, they, listen, now this is hard for us to wrap our minds around, but in that culture, a man would kiss another man on the lips. <laughs> okay, praise the Lord. No, I'm, I, and it's not a passionate thing. You know, it's just a greeting. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Yeah, I know it's America, and I know it. And it, it's not only America, it's Texas. We Texas, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we got our cowboy boots on or our cowboy hats on. We don't do much of that, right? My, let me just tell you the way it is around here sometimes. You walk up there and you want to get up. I'm a pastor, right? I'm a, y'all, y'all know I'm, in case you don't know it, I'm a pastor. I'm just, I know up here, the way I talk it probably don't give it away. But anyway, so sometimes I walk up there and I want to give a man a hug, just a hug. How, how you doing? You know, right? Well, some men, they are so masculine, you know. No, you ain't hugging me. Okay, whatever. <laughs> but in that culture, they would kiss on the lips. And it wasn't a passionate kiss. It was a greeting, right? And if you were a teacher, your students would take you by the hand. And they would kiss your hand. Because they so respected you as their teacher. And so when Judas Iscariot went and kissed Jesus, it wasn't a passionate kiss. It may have been on the cheeks, both sides of the cheeks, probably on the hand. Amen. Amen. Betrayed him as a friend. Verse 48. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same as he. Hold him fast. So you're not going to be able to tell the difference between all of them. So I'm going to give you this sign. I'm going to betray my friend with a kiss. For with he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. See, he showed an outward respect. But the Bible says he was the devil. Amen. Amen. Jesus says unto him, Friend. Look at this, friend. Wherefore art thou come? I told you last week that nobody could tell that Judas was Judas. By the way that Jesus treated him. When they were eating the the Lord's Supper that night. The Passover. Everybody said is it I? Is it I? Is it I? Is it I? Judas said is it I? Jesus says thou sayest that means yes. But nobody knew it was Judas. I believe that Judas didn't even believe that Jesus knew it was him. Because of the way that Jesus treated Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot wasn't a master of cover-up. God covered it. God hid Judas from being Judas to the rest of the people. You understand what I'm telling you? The love of God wrapped him in secrecy. Because he wanted, he was, God, Jesus was trying to reach Judas Iscariot all the way to the very end. He He knew, Jesus knew. What he was going to do. But he's still trying to reach him. So he would cover him. He would. Are you understanding? He would hide. From the rest of them. That Judas Iscariot was a thief. That's how much God loved. How much Jesus loved. I told you last week. It's phenomenal to me. To see the love of God. I see the love of God at Calvary. But when I see the love of God. Covering the traitor. When I see the love of God. Hiding, concealing. It was God that hid him. Nobody else. Because Jesus loved Judas Iscariot. 
when Jesus chose Judas Iscariot, he meant it. When he chose Judas to be one of the twelve, Jesus meant it, brothers and sisters. From Jesus' perspective, it wasn't a mistake. And when he chose you and when he chose me, he, Jesus meant it, brothers and sisters. Amen? And I'll tell you, there are things that you go through in your life that Jesus will cover. He'll hide it. He'll, now, this is probably hard for y'all to swallow, but this is the Bible. It's hard for you to believe, really, when I tell you that, that God covered Judas Iscariot. But you need to rejoice. Because God covers us and he protects us at times. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, church. Because he loves you that much, he may even know that you're going to quit him. He may even know that you're going to betray him. But it was still real when Jesus chose you. He meant it, brothers and sisters. It wasn't a mistake. Hallelujah. He loves every one of you. If you go away from the Lord, if you betray him, it's your decision. It's your decision. And he's going to do everything he can to try to protect that and, and, and hide that and keep you in a place that you can be reached. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Jesus meant it when he chose Judas Iscariot. The point is, yes, somebody would betray him, but it did not have to be Judas. There's going to be a false church system. I can roll that map out on prophecy. There's going to be a false church, the Bible says, right in the back of the scarlet-colored beast. We know there's going to be one, but I don't have to be a part of it. The Bible talked about there's going to be a great falling away in the last days. It will happen, but I don't have to be one of them. There's going to be a Judas company. See, there's just so much in this, but in the last days... What you have in miniature form in the days of Jesus in the last days will become multitudes of people. So in the last days where you have a Peter that, listen to me, that denied him but didn't betray him. A Peter that denied him backslid but was restored. He backslid, that means he moved from a previous experience that he had with God. To backslide means, and many of us have already done that many times. I know that shocks you too. You don't have to go to the world to backslide. To backslide means you had a, an experience with God that has declined. So that the experience you have right now is what, what, it's not what it used to be at one time in your life. If that's the case, then you have slipped. That means you have backslid. And there's different degrees of backsliding. Peter backslid. That means he slipped from an experience that he had with God before. But he didn't apostatize. He moved away, slipped away from an experience. But he never denied the truth. And that's why Peter could be restored because he never rejected the truth. He never apostatized. He just moved away or slipped away from an experience that he once had. To be an apostate, you don't just move from an experience. You abandon truth. The difference between Peter and Judas is that Peter backslid from an experience. Judas apostatized from the truth. Judas, listen, brothers and sisters, when he walked away from truth, when he rejected truth, he apostatized from the faith. That's why Judas Iscariot can't be saved. He wasn't saved because he never repented. You understand? I'm trying to help you today. So you may slip at times in your walk with God, backslide even in, still in the church. Oh, come on, hear me today. Don't look at me in that sanctimonious way. Every one of you here today can look at, and, and know there was a time in your life. Come on, somebody. 
that you walked in a level that right now you're not at maybe. Therefore, you have moved from an experience that you once had. But the good news is you can be restored if you will rep repent. You can get back what you lost if you will repent. You can be a Peter. Peter backslid, but Peter was used by God to preach on the day of Pentecost. Hallelujah to the Lamb. You're still a true believer. Your experience just is not what it should be. Get back to God and God can restore you and God can use you once again. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Now, I don't encourage you to backslide, of course, because, man, the enemy is going to come and hammer you with everything he's got. Oh, you're, you know you're lost. You, you know you'll never be amounting. No, man, if you're, listen, no, I'm just not where I used to be. But I can change that. The Bible says Peter went out and wept bitterly. He wept bitterly. Amen. That means he was true. His heart was broke. Man, Jesus looked at him. And I'm not reading all the verses right now. But Jesus looked at him. Jesus told him, you're going to betray me. You're going to deny me, not betray me. You're going to deny me. Before the cock crows twice, you're going to deny me three times. He said, oh, no, Lord. And when he did, the Bible says Jesus looked at him. Jesus looked at him. When he looked at him, well, how did he look at him? How did he look at Peter? Well, he probably looked at him and says, I told you. He looked at him with love. The look of love. He looked at him like with the look of discernment. So I told you he was going to do it. And you did it. But Peter went out and wept bitterly. And the Bible says when Jesus rose from the dead. He told amen the women. That, there's, that saw him resurrected from the dead. He said you go and tell my disciples. Ah oh, hold on. Not just the disciples. But go and tell Peter also. Because the Lord knew the devil was probably beating him up, man. The devil was coming after him. You with me? So Jesus said, you go tell my disciples, but you tell Peter also. He backslid. He slipped from an experience, but he didn't walk away from the truth. He kept believing. He kept believing. And be oh, hallelujah to the Lamb. You might slip. From a previous experience. But never deny the truth. Never reject the truth. Maintain convictions brothers and sisters. Amen. Let's say somebody does backslide out of the church. And they go to the world. Or they just, maybe they just were discouraged. Are you understanding? Maybe they, it wasn't in their heart. They didn't want to quit God. They didn't want to quit the church, but they just got discouraged. They went through something, and they go, okay, I'm just done, and they leave. Amen? But they never gave up their convictions. You understand what I'm saying? And I'm not talking about rules, and I'm not talking about legalism. I'm talking about something that's in the heart that promotes holiness. And that person may, you know, quit going to church or whatever for a period of time. And I'm not advocating. I'm just giving you an understanding. Because they got discouraged or something, you know, overwhelming in their life. But they kept living holy. They maintain a standard of holiness. Brothers and sisters, look for those people to come back. They'll make their way back because they're sheep. They're lost out there. They wandered away just temporarily. But they'll make their way back. And when they do, God is going to restore them. Hallelujah. Give God praise in the house. There's times when people are going to get discouraged and overwhelmed in life. And respond like Peter did because the pressure's on. You know? Well, what's important? Did Peter make it back? Jesus said, you go tell my disciples and you tell Peter also. I'm risen from the dead. Woo! And Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. And tradition says that he died upside down on a cross. When they got ready to kill him, crucify him, he said, traditionally, it's tradition. He said, nail me upside down. 
Because I'm not worthy to be hung on the cross like my Lord. Look at your neighbor and help me preach. Go and tell Peter also. This gives me hope. It should give you hope. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Man, I feel, I feel the Holy Ghost all over me right now. Give God praise in the house. What a mighty God he is. So Judas went out and betrayed him. He, he didn't just deny him. He betrayed him. And then he walked in. You know, his world fell apart because Jesus didn't do what he thought he was supposed to do. And that means to overthrow the Roman government, set up the kingdom, and make him one of the people sitting on the throne. Just going to die. And so his world fell apart. And he, he agreed for 30 pieces of silver to betray the Lord. And at the end, he took that 30 pieces of silver and threw it on the table and said, I've betrayed innocent blood. So that even the, even the devil had to say that Jesus was innocent. But the Bible says what happened to him, he went out and hung himself. And when he did, whatever he bound his neck with broke. He landed at the bottom and his bowels gushed out. And the Bible said he went to his own place in hell. Brothers and sisters, he apostatized from the faith. He rejected the truth. He rejected Jesus Christ. Somebody that crosses that line. They reject the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. They blaspheme the Holy Ghost. They speak evil of the Holy Ghost. They reject truth. They abandon it. They don't just abandon it. They deny it. That person, if they apostatize, will never make it back. I'm thankful today that Peter didn't apostatize. He just backslid. And that's enough. But when you look at the story of Peter, and I'm not reading all the verses because I don't have time this morning, you will see how carefully the writers of the Gospels are when it comes to the failure of Peter. They don't just, they don't get in there in all the mud, you know, and bring out all the mud and... They don't do that. They just very carefully make their way through this part. Because it's the truth. But grace showed up in Peter's life. A smoking flax will he not quench. A bruised reed will he not break. If you're bruised this morning, he's not going to break you. If you're just smoking just a little bit, he's not going to put it out. Hallelujah. He'll fan the flame. He'll take the bruised reed, bind it up until you get healed. You can get back on your feet again. Hallelujah to the Lamb. I wish I could say as your pastor that I've never missed a step. I wish I could say as your pastor that I've always been perfect in everything. I wish I could say as your pastor that I've always been on the mountaintops. But I'm telling you today, that's not reality. I thank God for the grace of God. Hallelujah. That keeps me. I'm kept by His power. I'm kept by His strength. Peter meant well, but he didn't pray. Amen. So there's a difference between a backslider and apostate. Are you thankful today for the grace of God? <laughs> Woo! You know who I want to hear preach? I'll tell you who I want to hear preach. Somebody that's been broken. Somebody that's been through some things. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Hallelujah. Not somebody that thinks, you know pridefully that they deserve to be there no I want to hear it from somebody that doesn't feel like they deserve to stand behind the pulpit and preach somebody that doesn't feel like they deserve to do anything in the church those are the people I want to hear from hallelujah because they've been taken up they've been bound up by the God they've been healed they've been set free they've been delivered they've been recovered they've been restored and when they stand up and preach to me that's going to help me get up out of my mess 
And I'm not advocating failure. I'm just telling you that's life. It's reality. It's the real world. We're not in heaven yet. We all come short of the glory of God. And when God picks you up and dusts you off and puts you back on the road, hallelujah, you're going to sing like you've never sung before. You're going to preach like you've never preached before. You're going to win souls like you've never won souls before because God took you out, raised you up, dusted you off, gave you a new song in your night season, gave you a message to preach. That's who I want to hear from. Not the arrogant and the prideful who feels like they deserve to be on the platform or behind the pulpit. Give me somebody sometimes that doubts their call. Right. And has to come to terms with their own humanity. And that person, when they preach, the tears will flow. When that person preaches, their heart will be exposed. And it impacts people's lives. Give God praise in the house. Are you thankful today? I'm thankful today. Praise God. Hey, come and arrest Jesus. Verse 50, Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. Amen. One of them took a sword that time and cut his ear off. Boom. Just cut his ear off. You know what I mean. Who was that? Probably Peter. <laughs> I think it was Peter. I think the Bible says, I think it was Peter. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know? I mean, yeah. Oh, Peter. Cut his hair off. Yeah, hallelujah. No, Peter, you don't fight God's battles the ways of the world. When you try to fight God's battles the way the world fights, it's wrong. And a lot of times, that's exactly what we do. We try to fight like the world fights. Come on, somebody. With retaliation and vengeance, and I'll show them, and I'll get back at them, and, you know, cutting people's ears off. That's not the way of God, brothers and sisters. We don't fight the way the world fights. And Jesus picked up that ear, put it back on the side of his head. And he says, he that lives by the sword shall die by the sword. You don't fight the battles of your life the way the world fights them. Thank you, Jesus. Brother, when, they cut, when he cut his ear off, let me say this to you. There is some historical uh, commentary on the text that says the man could have died. And he may have died. Now, the Bible didn't say he died, but he may have died. So Jesus may not just put his ear back on his head. He may have raised him from the dead. I will just tell you, this is the last miracle of Jesus before he ever went to Calvary. Oh, brothers and sisters, how many times has Bishop cut people's ears off? Not me. I don't cut people's ears off, but got that sword out. Woo! We forgive you, Bishop, for cutting our ears off. Hallelujah. I probably cut a few ears off myself. You don't think I'm doing God's will? Woo! Cut your ear off. And the Lord says, okay, here, I'll, I'll, I'll get you out of this one, Peter. I'll get you, this, get you out of this one, Pastor. I'll put the ear back on. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord, church. Mm. Have I cut any of y'all's ears off? Yeah, a few of y'all cut a few years. Yeah, right. Praise the Lord. I got them all over the place, man. Lord God, heal them all. Put all their ears back on. Amen. And I, I'm sorry, but I just got yeah, that zeal, man. Boom, you know, hallelujah. But amen. Jesus got him out of another one. He ever noticed this man, he just, if he's not putting his foot in his mouth, You know what I mean? He had a disease. He always put his foot in his mouth. He's not always putting his foot in his mouth. They're cutting people's ears off. 
Just always having to bail him out. Come on, Peter. Come on. We already saw him when he was a disciple, right? Probably three, three and a half years walk with Jesus. He would look at Peter. Sometimes he'd say, Simon. Amen. Simon, you're acting like Simon. Because Simon means, you know, dust or whatever. Right? Simon. And then sometimes he'd say, Simon, Simon. You're really acting fleshly now. Amen. And then sometimes he would say, Simon, Peter. You're acting like Simon, but remember who I said you were. Oh, I'm Peter. That's right. So sometimes the Lord comes to you and he says, Simon, because you're acting like Simon. And then sometimes he says, Simon, Peter, because he wants you to remember what he said about you. Amen? Are you with me? If you're walking around, they all beat up. The devil's just beat you up and everybody else beating you up. And then somebody walks up and says, man, you're awesome. You go, that's right, I am. <laughs> Amen. You know what I'm saying? That's Jesus. Man, Jesus was a master. He was a master of men. So Simon, Simon, you're really acting like Simon right now. Simon Peter, you're acting like Simon. Remember who I said you were. And sometimes we just say, Peter, you're the rock. You're the rock. Give God praise in the house. <laughs> Smote his ear off, man. Cut his ear off. Verse 52, then, then said Jesus unto him, put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Amen. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father? He shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels. 12 legions of angels. So I'm going to just pray right now. And God will send the armies of heaven to set me free. Give God praise. They said, I'm fulfilling scriptures. This, thus it must be. In that same hour, said Jesus to the multitudes, are you come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sit daily with you teaching in the temple and you laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. They, then all the disciples forsook him. Wow. Something very interesting that John points out that we don't have in the text of Matthew is that when they asked him if he was Jesus, he said, I am. And the Bible says when he said I am, they fell to the ground. Because I am is God. And he claimed to be God at the, to the very last minute. He claimed to be God. I am that I am. And the, just the power of that statement. I am the eternal God. I will be what I will be. The eternal God. They fell to the ground, brothers and sisters. Huh? Listen to your pastor for just a moment. Okay. Be careful when you're in a church service and people are falling to the ground. Because in the Bible, it was the unbelievers that fell to the ground. So when we pray for people, if I feel like they're fixing to go down, I say, help them. We're going to hold them up. Are you with me? Because when people fell to the ground, they were unbelievers. And not only we, do we not want you to be an unbeliever fall to the ground, but we want to hold you up because what we're doing with you, we want to finish. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you didn't hear that. You didn't hear that. Okay. And sometimes that's just a cop out. Woo! That's just a cop out. I am that I am. Boom, man, they went to the ground. I am. Beautiful, huh? Say, praise the Lord, church. How many of y'all ever been in church? And I mean, it's crazy. It is crazy. You know, some churches, man, they put their hand in there and push them down, man. Bye, right? Hallelujah. You don't want them to fall. Trying to make them fall. Everybody with me today? Amen. The unbelievers fall to the ground. We'll take a stand for the Lord. 
They took Jesus from there to the Garden of from the Garden of Simeon. I'm coming to a close here. And they took him to Annas and then Caiaphas and ended up in the palace of the high priest and put Jesus on trial at night against the law. It was against the law. The trial of Jesus was against the law. It was done at night. They compel false witnesses to speak against him. Brothers and sisters, that religious priesthood was as corrupt as it could possibly be. Even Josephus, a first century Jewish historian who turned Roman, who was a member of the priestly family, said that in his writings. That this priesthood, the Sanhedrin court, was corrupt to the core. And they would oftentimes lie. And they did here. They broke the rules to get their way. Tried him at night. Solicited false witnesses against him. Didn't go through the normal process. And if I were to take time to talk about the process of a trial in those days, you know, you might glean a little bit out of it. But I'm not going to get into all those details. But it is interesting. Yes, Amen. That if you had witnesses against you, there were a couple of witnesses that were released to go through the streets. And one would ride down the road to Gehenna. Gehenna was where Jesus was crucified, by the way. Which was the place of a garbage dump. Outside of the city of Jerusalem. That he might redeem you from hell. But they would send a rider down the road that would lead to Gehenna. And he would cry out for anybody that wasn't a family member to come and testify on the behalf of the accused. I don't see where any of that was followed. They broke rule after rule after rule to condemn him to death. Fulfillment of the scriptures. They laid, had laid hold on him. Jesus led him away to Caiaphas. And the high priest, the scribes, the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him afar off under the high priest's palace. And went in and sat with the servants to see the end. So we see the progression of Peter still here. He's following Jesus from afar. He's following him from a distance. See, he wanted to appear like he was with him, but he wasn't. He wanted to appear like he was with him, but he wasn't. When you follow Jesus from a distance, it'll always lead to failure. I don't want to follow Jesus at a distance. I want to, I want to get close to him. Here he is, is surrounded by religious people here. They sought false witnesses, verse 59, against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses. And they said, this man has said he will destroy the temple. Twisting the truth. See, what happened is their witnesses, the false witnesses came. But the ones that came, they, they, there was no validity there. But now we got a couple of witnesses that showed up and they got a little bit more validity to their mind. And they said, this fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. They thought he was talking about Herod's temple. They were twisting what Jesus said. He said, I'll just, just destroy this temple in three days. Jesus said, I'll raise it up. And then it goes on and says, he spoke of his body. The Gospel of John says he spoke of his body. They twisted what he said. And said he said he would destroy the temple of Herod. Oh brothers and sisters. That's all they needed. That Jesus said the temple. He would destroy the temple of God. That he would destroy the most holy site in Israel. He would destroy what represents the salvation of God. He would, rep he would destroy what represented the presence of God among them. That's all they wanted to hear. But it was a lie because it was twisted. They took his words and twisted them on him. High priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. 
Why was he not? Why was he holding his peace? We knew they're going to twist the truth on him. They already did. But he's holding his peace because as the sin bearer, as a lamb before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Because at some point, the sins of the world, he's carrying them. He already agreed to it at the Garden of Gethsemane. He already agreed to carry them. He has become the sin bearer. So he doesn't open his mouth like a lamb before his shearers is dumb. Isaiah 53. But when the high priest puts him in an oath to swear by oath, then he answers. Verse 63, but Jesus held his peace and the high priest answered and said to him, I adjure thee, I'm putting you under an oath by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Are you the Messiah? Are you Mashiach? Are you the Messiah of God? The Son of God? Are you God in flesh? Because he put him under an oath. Jesus answers. Jesus saith unto them, Thou hast said. That means yes. He says, Thou hast said. He's saying, You, that's the answer. Yes. You said it. Nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Remember Daniel chapter 7? He's coming in the clouds of heaven. Listen to me. The one who comes in the clouds of heaven is God because God is the one who rides the clouds in the heavens. And when Jesus said, you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power coming in the clouds of heaven. He declared to be the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 7. The God man who rides upon the clouds. Woo, hallelujah to the Lamb. Claiming to be God in flesh. The eternal king. Verse 65. Then the high priest rent his clothes. Broke the law. Leviticus 21 and 10 tells us that the, the priest, the high priest, the officials were not to never tear their clothes. And he rent his clothes. Breaking the law of God Almighty. When he did that. It shows you the end of that earthly priesthood had come to an end. The Levitical priesthood is fulfilled. And the one standing there that day is the true high priest of God Almighty. And there will never be, listen to me, an earthly priesthood ever again. A spiritual priesthood of believers, but they are kings, king priests after the order of Melchizedek. That means if you go to a priest and confess your sins, you have to understand that priesthood is over with. Jesus is the high priest of God standing in front of them. Just like as I said when he took the Lord's Supper, there was no lamb on that table. He took the bread and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples. And that bread was symbolic of the lamb that he would become on their behalf. You can't find in your Bible where there was a lamb on Passover with Jesus. They were all over the city of Jerusalem. They had lambs, but not on his table. He, the Bible said he took bread and broke it. And said, this is my body. I'm the broken lamb. Why? Because he's the true lamb of God. There will never need to be another lamb sacrificed unto God. Because God, Jesus is the true lamb of God. And he's the true high priest of God. The high priest, once they tore their garments, could never continue in that office again. What further need we have? We are witnesses. Behold, now you've heard his blasphemy. What thank ye? They answered and said, he is guilty of death. Then did they spit on his face and buffeted him. And others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? There he is standing, humiliated, spit, the highest level of insult that you could give a person. Right. Whew, hitting him in the face with the palms of their hands, asking him to prophesy. 
Let's see where Peter is. Now Peter sat without in the palace and a damsel came into him saying, Thou also was with Jesus. See, he walked with the scornful. He walked. I'm going to go and make sure I got the text right in Psalm 1. Psalm 1, the Bible says this. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Nor standeth in the way of sinners. Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Peter went through every one of those. He followed Jesus at a distance. He stood among those. And then he sits. Peter sat without in the palace. And a damsel came unto him saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all saying, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was going out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were, were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. When it says he denied with an oath, that means a curse. He cursed. He cursed himself. He said, if what I am saying is not true, let me be cursed. So it's more than cussing. He pronounced a curse on his head if what he was saying wasn't true. He condemned himself. Because what he said wasn't true. He condemned himself with his own mouth, with a curse. But Jesus still forgave him. Not a cuss, a curse. But I will say this to you because it makes good preaching. When the church through history looked at the lives of people. And they wanted to make a distinction between the saved and the lost. They always noted that those that cuss are a sign of an unbeliever. Those who don't cuss are marked as having true faith. Now how many of you brothers and sisters when you used to be in the world cuss like a sailor? See y'all are all honest man. See you're honest about me cutting your ears off. Now you're honest about how you used to cuss like a sailor. Did you notice when you got filled with it, even the prophetess has got both hands up. <laughs> Hallelujah to the Lamb. Praise the Lord, right? But did you notice when you got in the church, you got filled with the Holy Ghost, what happened to your tongue? Enough said. Say praise the Lord, church. Why? Because now the Spirit of God is in control of that tongue that's set on fire of hell. That tongue will be used to just like hell fire to destroy everything in its path without God. But when the Holy Ghost, that's the way you know you got the Holy Ghost. is when your tongue is under control. Because you can't tame your own tongue. Only God can tame your tongue. Hallelujah to the Lamb. So you say, well, I just let it slip. Get in the prayer room. Till the Holy Ghost takes control of your tongue. Say, praise the Lord. Well, I hit my finger with a hammer. And it came out. If you got enough God, it won't come out. <laughs> you with me? Somebody said, praise the Lord. Aren't y'all so glad Prophetess Melvis can put her hands down now? <laughs> Boy, I bet she could give us an earful. But that's what God does for you. He changes you. No. And that's really, a, and that's the Bible says, they shall speak with new tongues. New tongues. You've got a heavenly language. Hallelujah. Only God can do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's good. Look at, look at her and say, this is good preaching. Hallelujah. Yeah, man. Not because I'm doing it, but that's, this is good preaching. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad God set you free from that old? Mm. All the women said, praise the Lord. 
Oh, yeah, I'm not just talking to the men. I'm talking to the women. All the women said, praise the Lord. <laughs> Woo. Hallelujah. See, Sister Carol's got angel's wings sticking out of her back there now. <laughs> Hallelujah. And again, he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And after a while came unto him, they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art also one of them, for thy speech betrayeth thee. Amen. Hallelujah. Then began he to to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. Amen. Would you stand? Father God, we thank you for your awesome word this morning. Give you all praise and all glory and honor for your saving power, your strength. Thank you, Father God, that you're willing to go through the passion, pre-crucifixion torture. You had to do it all by yourself in our behalf. Lord, let us remain faithful to you to the end. And be encouraged by what we've heard this morning today, Jesus. And thank you, Lord, that you did not give up on us. Because you won't give up easy. And we give you the thanks and the praise, God, for your saving strength. And the passion of the Christ. Pre-crucifixion torture. Thank you for that kind of love that you have for us, God, today. You put our feet on the path again. You strengthen our hands. You strengthen our feet. You strengthen our hearts to keep on going. And by the passion of the Christ, we bless your name. Would you just lift your hands and worship him right now and thank him? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Go tell my disciples and Peter also. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Lord, we're not what we should be at times. We slip in our experience. But thank you for restoring us, God, and not putting out that flame. Or breaking that bruise reed. We worship you. We thank you today. For being our God and our Savior. I need you right now. I need you this morning. I need you now. I need you now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus today. Over my mind, my soul, and my spirit, plead your precious blood. Thank you for saving us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you real good. Thank you for being in the house of God.